Without further ado, Eugene Bagashoff. Okay, thank you guys. It's a really great thing to be here for the second time. Uh, and of course, I, I am very, very grateful to Ben and Kat and to all of you for coming here and to making this event possible. It's a really, really unusual and great experience. Uh, so, um, you know, in like 2014, when I was starting watching Ben's channel, uh, if somebody would say that in a couple of years, I am going to be talking at these conferences, I wouldn't believe them. Uh, and even to this day, actually, uh, when I think about it, it it's like, like, like I'm walking around in a dream or something. It's a pretty unusual experience. Okay, so just a couple of words about myself. Uh, ben has actually asked me to introduce myself. So I am a researcher at the Joint Institute for Power and Nuclear Research, SOSNI, in Minsk, Belarus. This is a part of uh, National Academy of Sciences of Belarus. So I work in theoretical physics, namely particle physics. Uh, so this exact topic is not my academic specialty, so do not, like, reference me as any kind of authority in these questions, if, if anything. But uh, I'm pretty interested in this topic, and I, th I feel like it's really important and relevant to what Ben does and hopefully what you are interested in. So uh, I'm going to be talking about atmospheric structures in the global electric circuit. Uh, but first, I'm going to give some basic definitions of things I'm, of things I'm going to talk about, because uh, after last year's talk, uh, I had uh, people approached me and asked me some questions from which I understood that uh, there was no like clear understanding of what exactly I was talking about. So it was kind of, <laughs> it was actually my fault that I didn't pay too much attention to like the very basics, like what do I mean when I say cyclone or anti-cyclone. So I'll try to uh, correct this with this section, the, fir the very first one. Um, then I'm going to proceed to give you a couple of highlights from my previous year's talk because I feel that it's really important uh, and plus there has been some new findings from like Juno probe that's currently in orbit around Jupiter that kind of reinforces the, the, the hypothesis that I was talking about in the previous year. And then uh, I'll have these three uh, points marked with red. Um, namely the experiment with ion wind, a uh, hypothesis about the sun and a hypothesis about the earth, they kind of make up the, the core of what I'm going to talk about today. And it was a, an experiment with ion wind that kind of fascinated me and uh, made me think about things, in particular about Earth's atmosphere, which I call the hypothesis, what I have to say about it. Uh, and, and, and I also have a sort of a supplementary hypothesis about the sun, which I call a hypothesis in this case. Uh, and to put this talk into a bigger perspective, so last year I was talking about the possible impact of Earth's magnetic field onto the formation of various atmospheric structures. And here we are going to look into the electrical side of things. So what role could the electric field of Earth play in the formation of, say, cyclones or hurricanes, that kind of stuff? So let's get started. So as I've promised, uh, I'll start with the definition. So when I say atmospheric structure, I would mean by that a persistent large-scale pattern of atmospheric circulation characterized by certain parameters, such as pressure, temperature, density, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so when I say persistent, I mean a few days or, or more. So some of these structures may live for months, possibly, or even years. Uh, there are, of course, various, um, like, um, oscillatory motions in the atmosphere that kind of repeat themselves on certain time scales. But we're going to talk about uh, such structures that live for at least a couple of days. For example, like a tropical cyclone, it, it might live for, for a week or something like that. That kind of stuff is what we're going to discuss here. And when I say large scale, I mean hundreds of kilometers or more. So this is a relatively big structure. Sometimes they like uh, span the whole continents. Um, we're not talking about some uh, localized turbulence and uh, uh, fluctuations and that kind of stuff. We're talking about the, the bigger stuff. All right. So here's a couple of examples. 
uh, of atmospheric structures as I understand it. So again, I'm not a meteorologist, so these definitions kind of do not work outside this talk, <laughs> sort of. Uh, but this is what I would understand when I say these words. So examples of atmospheric structures might include cyclones and anticyclones, and I've marked them with red again because mostly I'm going to be focused on, on these guys. And we also have convergence lines that Ben tends to favor in his morning news. He often talks about it. So basically when the one air mass collides with another and, and slows down and there's all, all kinds of processes such as cloud condensation happening and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't talk about this much. But they also uh, might be uh, created through interaction of cyclones with anticyclones, pretty much. And we have also a curious thing called Rossby waves which uh, looks like this. So here you have a picture of jet stream. And uh, well, since the topology of our planet allows air to kind of wrap around the whole planet, uh, such standing waves are possible here. Uh, so that, uh, you know, the jet stream might undulate uh, and there, there would be a standing wave in this undulation. So these are called Rossby waves. And I'll, I'll also show you at the very end of my talk how these can be produced through interaction of cyclones and anticyclones, which in their turn might be produced uh, according to my hypothesis uh, due to the electric field of Earth, okay? So um, by cyclone, I would mean a low pressure atmospheric cell that is a pocket of air with relatively low pressure with respect to its surrounding air masses, okay? So basically any pocket of low pressure uh, air, I would call this a cyclone, all right? An anticyclone is, on the contrary, it's a high pressure cell. Uh, so it's basically any pocket of air with high pressure with respect to the surrounding air. And just, uh, I wasn't aware of the fact that Perhaps in the U.S. people don't use this word often, anti-cyclone. So I was kind of, uh, that was uh, unexpected to me, let, let's put it that way. So, so I, <laughs> and so if you look at this picture, it kind of gives you a measure of how low I sank with my laziness uh, about this presentation. Because this is even, this is not even my drawing. I, I borrowed it <laughs> from some other anonymous guy on the internet. Uh, <laughs> But it kind of gives you an idea of what kind of convective patterns are characteristic in cyclones and anticyclones, right? So a cyclone is, a, again, a low pressure cell where you have a convective updraft. So there's a upwards motion of air uh, so that it, since the pressure is low, it kind of sucks in below near the surface, then it rises up and spreads out uh, at the top of this structure, which is maybe like 10 to 15 kilometers or something like that. Uh, and in anticyclone, it's vice versa. It, the, the air kind of gathers at the top, then it goes down, and, which is kind of understandable because the pressure is high, so the air is going down, and then it spreads out near the surface. So, so they kind of um, are complementary to each other in a, in a way. And I would show how this might follow from my hypothesis a bit later. Uh, but what I want you to really uh, remember uh, from this slide is that cyclone is an upward motion of air and anticyclone is a downward motion of air, all right? Uh, this, is, this is going to be important a couple of slides later. So, of course, we have strong cyclones with really, really low pressure inside, and they are called, usually called hurricanes or typhoons. They bring a lot of thunderstorms and very strong winds. So here's just one, one relatively recent example, Hurricane Irma uh, in September of 2017. It was, the, I believe, the strongest hurricane of the whole year. And what actually is interesting about this, this is not related to my talk, but I have to mention this, is that uh, this hurricane appeared like literally at the time when we had the strongest solar flare in like 12 years. So on September 6th, there was an X9.3, I believe, solar flare. And right afterwards, there was Hurricane Irma, then Hurricane Maria uh, a little bit later. And also we had a strongest earthquake at September 8th, exactly, uh, near the coast of Mexico. Uh, the strongest earthquake of the year, I mean. 
And so, and what is interesting about this is that this solar flare occurred literally like three days before the perihelion of the single, of the only known interstellar object, uh, which kind of makes you think about things. So if you're interested about in this kind of stuff, I have a video at Thunderbolts Project YouTube channel, uh, and you can look it up, and I have all kinds of weird hypotheses about this there. So if you're interested, then look it up. Okay, so of course, not only do cyclones and anti-cyclones have this vertical convective motion, also if we look at them like from, from the top, they also move in, in horizontal plane. They demonstrate this vorticity. In particular, cyclone rotates uh, counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, which you can see on the left, and anti-cyclone turns uh, clockwise in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so they demonstrate kind of um, uh, uh, rotation in the opposite sense. And in the southern hemisphere, it's vice versa. The anti-cyclone turns counterclockwise and cyclones rotate clockwise. And this is an, another important thing uh, to remember. And in my previous year's talk, uh, I was talking about how this exact vorticity in the horizontal plane might be induced by the interaction of charged particles with Earth's magnetic field. So if you're interested, then go and look my previous uh, OTF talk. So what do I mean when I say global electric circuit? Well, it's a set of electromagnetic connections between the ground, atmosphere, and space. So what kind of connections uh, do I mean here? Those are mostly electric currents and electromagnetic induction. There are pro probably some other processes that are involved, but those are perhaps the main ones. Um, and so, and, and when I say between the ground, uh, I believe that also everything that's below the ground is also somehow involved. So, but uh, well, it's of course really hard to like, we cannot measure anything like in the mantle or something, but still I have to make this um, note here. And of course I emphasize the word space because sometimes you can see uh, schemes like this one where you basically only have like Earth's features like ionosphere and atmosphere and ground, but it kind of ignores all the connections that we have to space, uh, again, through the electric currents, electromagnetic induction. So sometimes people draw equivalent circuits for this, which might look like that. Uh, I won't be talking about this, but I really do believe that these complicated systems of currents that we have, even in our lowest uh, magnetosphere in our ionosphere, plasma sphere, and so on and so forth, do play a major role in this global electric circuit. So, so that's why I emphasize the word space. Of course, uh, one can ask a question, okay, but, but uh, everything in the universe is connected through plasma, essentially. I mean, be between us and some distant galaxy, there's plasma, right? So th there should be connections to even to distant galaxies again. And, and, and I, I think this is a valid question. So uh, where do you kind of cut, cut this circuit off? When do you consider that you um, have everything you need? But at least I think if we consider the Earth's atmosphere, ionosphere, and so forth, and consider input from galactic cosmic rays, solar radiation, solar particles, and, and so on and so forth, uh, we're pretty good to go already with this. Uh, but, uh, of course, in general, maybe there are some connections to even the, the objects that are even farther, but it's more of a philosophical thing at this point. So, uh, as I promised, I'm going to give you a couple of highlights from my talk from previous year because I really do believe that they deserve to be mentioned again. So, the talk was about the possible role of Earth's magnetic field in the formation of cyclones and anti-cyclones. Um, and the key point is that this vorticity in the horizontal plane might be induced through interaction of charged particles and dipolar mo molecules of water with magnetic field of Earth. That was a key point. I was describing the theory by Pavel Mantishan, who developed this. Uh, and this is one of the highlights which I really feel is important. Uh, is, this is the map of the magnetic field of Earth. And of course, we have this prominent region of really low magnetic field strength around South, Southern America, uh, the, uh, the Southern Atlantic Anomaly, where the field is roughly twice as weak with respect to the field at the poles, let's say. And uh, 
what is curious about this area is that we never observe strong cyclones there. So in my opinion, this is the uh, evidence that the magnetic field actually plays a crucial role. So here uh, are the tracks of this, uh, the hurricanes over some long time span. So you can see there are, there are no strong cyclones in this area where the field is we the weakest. And it's, it's a pr pretty, pretty important thing, I think. Another point is Jupiter's big red spot, because this is, of course, the picture from Juno probe that is currently orbiting the giant planet. And so it is supposed to be a high pressure cell. Why? Because it spins as an anti-cyclone would spin on Earth. So nobody has actually measured the pressure inside of it, but they think it's, it's a high pressure cell because it spins as a high pressure cell would spin on Earth. But uh, all the data shows that actually, you see the, the quote here, both the Juno and Gemini observations, Juno is the probe and Gemini is a telescope, uh, imply upwelling air in the center that is surrounded by subsidence. So it is exactly the convective structure of a cyclone, which is a low pressure cell. So the question arises, why do what seems to be a low pressure cell rotates as, as a high pressure cell would rotate on Earth? Because if, if this rotation is caused by Coriolis force, obviously it would, it would drive the same direction of rotation. But the answer is, according to this theory that I was talking about last year, is that the magnetic field, field of Jupiter is uh, inverse with respect to the magnetic field of Earth. So uh, we have kind of the opposite poles with respect to Jupiter. Uh, on Earth, the magnetic northern pole is in the southern hemisphere in Antarctica, and magnetic south is in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it, it's a, actually a thing that causes confusion many times, but it, it's like that because, you know, the northern tip of your compass would show to the north where the South Pole is. That's why <laughs> this discrepancy appeared. So, but on Jupiter, it's the other way around. The magnetic north is in the north. So according to this theory, Pavel Manteshian's theory, that will cause cyclones rotate in the opposite direction, an anti-cyclone. So this, this would explain why big red spot have a convective structure of a cyclone, which is a low pressure cell, but spins like a high pressure cell would spin on Earth. And Literally, I was on the plane on that day when this article came uh, from NASA. Uh, it's about Neptune storms. Uh, so Neptune also has these powerful storms going around. And it turns out that um, many of them swirl in an anticyclonic direction and is dredging up material from deep inside. So again, we have convective structure of a cyclone, a low pressure cell, and somehow this structure rotates as a high pressure cell would on Earth. And the answer according to this theory is again, the orientation of the magnetic field of Neptune, which is kind of tilted and shifted, but still, the magnetic north is in the northern hemisphere, which makes the rotation of cyclones and anticyclones reverse with respect to Earth, according to this theory. And I believe those are pretty strong points. Um, so uh, I reviewed this magnetic part of the story, and l now let's talk about the electricity, all right? So there's an experiment which fascinated me, and it's pretty simple. So you can look the description of it, but although it's in Russian, maybe you can use Google Translate or something. Uh, there's a link up there. There's also my review in my uh, Electric Universe related blog, um, where I uh, put some of these hypotheses out. Um, so the setup of this experiment is pretty simple. We have a cathode plate, a metal plate essentially, uh, on top of which there's a layer of oil and there's an anode up above, which is essentially in this setup, it's just a, like a needle, uh, a spiky thing. Uh, and, and we have, uh, uh, we uh, put the voltage difference between cathode and anode of about five kilovolts. And what is going to happen in this case Oh, this is the actual setup that they've used. So you can see this uh, cylindrical uh, container 
uh, like sitting on top of the metal plate, which is a cathode, and uh, there's an oil in this container, and there's a needle, which is an anode, on top of it, and there's something happening to the oil, okay? So this is what we're going to talk about now. What happens uh, when we put this uh, voltage difference there? So on the anode, there's a corona discharge, which ionizes the air, and of course, the electrons, that it, it means it strips away electrons from the atoms in the air. So electrons have a pretty easy way of reaching anodes, so they do that. But what about the positive charges, the, 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 those heavy ions of the air? So they try to reach cathode, they start, start moving downwards, but they encounter this layer of oil, which prevents them from easily uh, falling onto the cathode. And they start imposing pressure on this layer of oil. And due to some fluctuations, some nonlinear phenomena perhaps, some of the ions would manage to get a little bit closer to the cathode. And so the other ions would, would tend to go into the small dimple created by this uh, first ion. And so these dimples would, would grow. They would become deeper and, and wider over time. And um, by increasing pressure, uh, excuse me, the, the voltage difference, uh, you would have more and more such dimples everywhere. And it would look like this. Uh, this is the actual picture from their setup. And of course, uh, those uh, trypophobic of you already appreciated this picture, I'm sure. Uh, and, and if you don't know what trypophobia is, uh, believe me, you don't want to know. Uh, <laughs> so this is pretty much what I've already said. Uh, and if you increase the voltage even more, there are some canals or channels formed between those dimples. So, so the ions start bombarding the, the, the uh, area between those dimples, and, and they start merging at some points. This is the, of course, not the actual picture, but the, the actual picture looks something like this. Uh, you can see that some of these dimples kind of merge with those uh, relatively wide channels, right? And if you increase the voltage even more, it all ends up being in a, like a continuous mesh, like a cellular pattern uh, forms in this oil. Again, this is all, all only due to the pressure of iron wind. So we, we don't have anything except the layer of oil and the voltage difference. And discharge goes on, ions fall down, and cause this, this pattern to form. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And, um, the evidence that it is due to iron wind comes from the fact that if you block a part of uh, uh, this container with a glass, so the, the, the glass would be in between the anode and the oil, the pattern stops forming under the glass. So it's really the iron wind, not the electric field itself, but the iron wind that falls down that causes this pattern to form. And here's a couple of nice pictures again. So uh, to the left, you, you can see this setup in the dark. You can see the discharge and, and this cellular pattern down below, uh, which looks, looks pretty amazing. And uh, to the right, you, you can see the shot with long, long exposure. And you can, you can see how discharge kind of looks for these hot spots where the oil is, is a bit thinner or maybe the voltage dif difference is a bit bigger due to some fluctuations. Uh, of course, in real life, in real time, it doesn't look as violent as here, but uh, it's still a pretty nice picture. So uh, another interesting thing is that at lower pressure, the effect is actually more pronounced uh, since there is less collisions of these charged particles, so they have more uh, free path to accelerate in the electric field. So they have more energy when they reach the oil and thus impose bigger pressure and it's easier for this pattern to form. Uh, here's a video of those dimples. It looks pretty amazing and, and you can see how some of them merge, right? What are the shiny things? Uh, this is, I think it's just like a flare, a flare from the lamp. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of... Um, uh, gl gl yeah, reflection, exactly. So it's kind of a glassy uh, oil uh, surface that's causing this. Uh, so here's another experiment where you can see this forming uh, right out of nothing, right? So here we, uh, they uh, switch the voltage and that's what's happening. Is that also in oil? Yeah. 
It's the same setup. Photosphere. <laughs> that was a spoiler, man. <laughs> okay, and here's another video where they put a match, a flame, to this setup. And you can see how the flame is d diverted because the flame is a plasma, right? It's, it's essentially charged particles right, right away. So, yeah, and you can see how this stuff is boiling. Although there is no boiling, it's just the ion wind pressure there. Pretty cool stuff, I think. So, so maybe a similar mechanism. So it got me thinking about many different things and I thought maybe this mechanism might be applied to larger scale processes and this is the one that Michael has already mentioned. It's the solar photosphere. Uh, now of course it might upset uh, Lisa and <laughs> uh, who was talking about solar granules. Uh, but it's a hypothesis, okay? So maybe the same process might be responsible for the formation of the granules on the solar photosphere, right? Because they kind of look similar. And um, I also want to mention Robitaille's model of liquid metallic sun. But Robitaille also uh, thinks that, um, I mean, at, in heliophysics, uh, the granules are supposed to be the result of convection. And Robitaille, even with his uh, liquid uh, model of the sun also thinks they are the result of convection, where the like those cylinders of uh, convective currents under the surface of the sun cause, uh, cause the surface to bump outwards into some in some areas which become granules. But maybe the same thing might be produced uh, through this ion wind pressure, just as I've shown you. Uh, I have to note, because I'm pretty sure there would be questions about it, uh, is whether we actually need to have a surface tension. I mean, oil is a liquid, it has surface tension, there are shear forces possible. So is it necessary for such pattern to occur? And, well, I think that it is not. I think we can achieve the same thing with gases, because gases also uh, can sort of counteract pressure to some degree. Um, and a lot of my further hypotheses rely on this uh, statement, but I'm not sure about this, so I might be wrong. But I think it, it's also possible with gases. So there's, of course, a question why this granulation pattern on the sun does not occur in sunspots, right? We don't see any granules in sunspots. And uh, I have an idea that maybe if this photospheric layer is kind of like the oil layer in this experiment, maybe the sunspots are kind of the holes in the oil. Like if we artificially make a hole in this oil and kind of sustain it by some means, uh, of course it would provide a better pathway for these ions to reach the cathode. There would be much stronger currents in these areas, which of course we observe on sunspots. I mean, coronal loops, are exactly the strong currents between uh, sunspots of different polarities that we literally can see in UV. So they're, they're, they're strong, strong currents that emit a lot of radiation. Um, so, so this is one idea. And this is kind of a stronger version of my hypothesis for this solar case, uh, is that granules are produced under the pressure of ion wind when the plasma is accelerated downwards by the electric field, which is supposedly exists between the uh, photosphere and chromosphere, or the lower corona, maybe. And so, um, uh, in this case, the photosphere of the sun might be a relatively thin layer of kind of less, less conductive material, I put the word liquid here, but again, maybe it's, it's not necessarily liquid. Uh, so kind of like in this experiment with the oil, we have this layer where we observe this granulation. Uh, and in, in this case, sunspots might be the holes in this liquid or gas where the more conductive underlying layer is seen. Because we know that sunspots are actually, again, dimples in the surface, they are lower than the regular photosphere. So this kind of falls into place. Um, and uh, again, another question that I uh, wasn't expecting to uh, like surface, but it did, is that, so, so would that mean that 
under the photosphere, we actually have a negatively charged layer on the sun because, uh, I mean, if, if, if the situation is the same as in this experiment, that would seem to be the case. But this is kind of a question that I, I, don't, I don't know what to do with uh, so far, but it's something I had to mention. So, and this is a kind of a weaker version of hypothesis. I thought that maybe sunspots might be those dimples uh, that I've shown you earlier, maybe there's a not enough voltage, sort of, to sustain granulation as in regular photosphere. So there are only this dimple, um, which is a sunspot. But uh, it's something to think about, I guess. It's basically a food for thought. So, so uh, and, and it goes, uh, as I've written here, is that the first point is actually the same as in the previous slide, but uh, the second point is different, is that the sunspots are these dimples in the photosphere which occur when the voltage is not high enough to sustain continuous granulation as in the rest of the photosphere. And of course, we might ask the question, uh, what is the role of the magnetic field what is the role of various plasma phenomena, such as, again, the, the alpha waves? I'm sure that the people trained in plasma physics would ask right away, so, okay, how can you, can, how can you have a constant electric field with Debye screening and things like that? Uh, and those are valid questions. <laughs> yeah, I admit it. But still, I think, I think it's a hypothesis that one might consider. Okay, so what about the Earth? And we're moving towards the main thing that I wanted to communicate. Uh, can similar patterns be observed here too? So, and here's straight away the hypothesis that I have is that the formation of atmospheric structures such as cyclones and anticyclones is influenced by the vertical electric currents in the Earth's atmosphere. So I just take this picture with the setup of the experiment and just write down to the right the corresponding layers that we have on Earth. So the anode, the positively charged electrode would correspond to ionosphere, which uh, conveniently enough on Earth is positively charged, okay? And then the oil would correspond to the lowermost layer of the atmosphere, which is the troposphere, the most dense layer, which basically, if you look at uh, the like mass of the atmosphere below like 20 kilometers, it's basically like 99% of all the mass of the atmosphere. So it's much denser than what is high ab higher above. And the ground, of course, plays the role of cathode, which is a negative, uh, negative uh, electrode. And again, the ground is negatively charged on Earth. It's not a big news. Uh, but the voltage difference is bigger than what we had in the experiment. We have like roughly 300 kilovolts between the ionosphere and the ground. And so it might provide energy for these, these ions to um, make stru structures similar to what we already saw, but, uh, excuse me, but uh, what we would observe, um, I mean, if you just take this setup as it is with the Earth, you would probably expect that the discharge would be more or less uh, homogeneous over the whole surface, so the uh, negative, uh, excuse me, negative charges would reach ionosphere, and the positive ions would just fall down everywhere more or less homogeneously. But there's a thing called Ampere's force that acts uh, between two charged particles moving in the same direction. So basically any two currents flowing in the same direction, they attract because of this Ampere's force. And so these infalling positive ions would also attract because of Ampere's force. And what my idea was that uh, they would tend to focus into narrower tubes sort of. By, by the way, this is the same process that causes Z-pinch effect in plasma. When the plasma kind of narrows down into a really, really strong current, it's exactly because of Ampere's force. So here's kind of the same process, but more relaxed in terms of energy. Uh, but this is my idea that those positive charges would be focused to some areas. And of course, those are the areas uh, denoted by one. But of course, since they become focused to one areas, uh, one set of areas, the other set of areas would become ion deficient. There would be less pressure from those infalling ions, and that would cause this pattern of alternating increased and decreased ion wind areas. And uh, 
we know a thing called Burns effect in the atmosphere, which basically states that the downwards current strength, it's actually an, an empirical law, it's not a theoretical construct. It says that the downwards current strength correlates with pressure, with atmospheric pressure. So this is something that we observe here, that where we have this increased current because of the focusing of this discharge to areas one, we would have higher pressure from these ions and the areas um, deficient in ion pressure would demonstrate lower atmospheric pressure too. Uh, and here's where the cyclones and anticyclones appear in my opinion. So in the areas where there's an increased pressure from these ion currents, we have anticyclones because there are higher pressure. In the areas where we have less ions, we have cyclones because the pressure is lower. Uh, because of this ion deficiency. And it goes as far as uh, that, uh, such that in cyclones, actually, the current turns the other way around and the positive starts going upwards. It's, it's a known thing. Uh, and so, so this downwards current over anticyclones, it's called the uh, fair weather return current, often referred to as such. Uh, and in cyclones, it's kind of the, the regular sort of current. But it goes upwards in cyclones and downwards in anticyclones. And here's a really oversimplified version of this. Uh, so, so what I've deno uh, denoted with green here is what is usually understood under the, under the global electric circuit concept. So it's this upwards current over the cyclone and downwards current in the anticyclone. It closes the loop between the ground and the ionosphere. Uh, but again, I, I want to stress the point that we also have to consider input from solar particles, galactic cosmic rays. So uh, the global circuit does, is not limited by only this, this loop, all right? Um, so uh, here I'm going to show you how you can generate Rossby waves that I've shown you earlier with this pattern. So just take this pattern straight away uh, that we had in the previous slides. And if you look at it from the top, Again, as I've said, the ant and we're looking at northern hemisphere in this case. So anticyclones rotate clockwise in the northern hemisphere, and cyclones rotate counterclockwise. And you can notice that where they collide, cyclone with anticyclone, the wind actually moves in the same direction. And it, it provides kind of an easy path for wind to flow around this structure, right? And what, we, what we, it's almost like gears, you know, in a mechanism. Uh, and so the wind would have a, a pretty easy way of going like this, uh, like, uh, like I've shown you in red. And uh, on the top, I've denoted the wind flow direction with these circles. Uh, the X in the circle means that the wind flows into the plane of picture, and the dot means it moves towards us from the plane of picture. So here's how you can pretty much generate this Rossby undulation that we saw, uh, say, for, for the jet stream, for example. And uh, again, j just for the sake of uh, com completeness, uh, I should mention that jet streams are the flows of air like uh, 10 to 20 kilometers up, up above, uh, really, really strong winds, like 200, 300 kilometers per hour. So those are really strong streams of wind. And here's an actual example. It's earth.nullschool.net. Uh, a snapshot from this um, model simulation. Uh, so here you can see a pattern of, uh, again, th this is the, the, the color denotes the wind speed. So you can see this really, really strong, strong winds going from left to right, from, from west to east. Uh, and it's kind of squeezed in between the system of uh, vort vort um, I don't know, circular structures, which are cyclones and anticyclones. And, uh, Here's how it looks like if you put the rotation direction there. So you can see like these uh, atmospheric structures, they kind of, again, squeeze this stream almost like gears. Uh, and it, it, has, it has a more or less easy path to go from west to east. Uh, and this is important because the undulations of jet stream, of course, uh, if they happen in the temperate latitudes, when we have a polar areas to the north and the tropical equatorial areas to the south, this undulation creates like pockets where the, for example, the hot air from the tropics may enter and the cold air uh, from the polar regions might also enter. So you, you might have 
at the same latitude, very different weather uh, because of that, because of these meridional flows, uh, north to south and vice versa. And in my opinion, this is the, one of the mechanisms of generation of weather anomalies, especially if we move into like the pronounced grand solar minimum, uh, because, well, here's one, one of the possible scenarios how you can uh, like acquire more weather anomalies with reduced solar activities. Uh, when we have reduced solar activity, again, as was shown yesterday, we have higher cosmic ray flux, which means we have higher ionization in the atmosphere because cosmic rays ionize our atmosphere, which in turn means that we have higher conductivity of the atmosphere, there are more free charges, and it also means that we have stronger vertical, vertical currents because at the same ionospheric potential, since we have more free charges, the current is going to increase. And that would mean that we have more intense structure formation if we are to believe this hypothesis that I proposed, and also the one from the previous year. Uh, we would have increased vorticity because of stronger cyclones and anticyclones, and we would have more intense Rossby waves because they might be formed, just as I've shown you. Uh, more jet stream undulations, more meridional airflows, and it would drive weather anomalies. So this is one of the possible mechanisms uh, of increasing uh, weather anomalies in uh, reduced solar activity uh, case. So here's this idea in a nutshell, summed up, uh, is that ions accelerated by the electric field of Earth try to reach its surface, but they bump into the lower atmosphere, the troposphere, the most dense part of, of our atmosphere. And Ampere's force helps to focus these ion flows and concentrate them into a relatively narrow regions. And in the troposphere, because of that, the pressure in these regions would increase, which would cause anticyclones to form. And because of this focusing, uh, some areas would become ion deficient. There would be decrease in pressure. The atmosphere would kind of swell upwards. The, the, the uh, flow of air would be predominantly upwards. And there we would have cyclones because of that. And here's sort of a bonus point. Uh, again, talking about my previous year's talk, is that anticyclones and cyclones would start spinning in the uh, counter-directed uh, uh, way because of the interaction of these charged particles and possibly water molecules with Earth's magnetic field. And the, again, the opposite direction of rotation is caused by the opposite direction of the current in the first place. So, uh, kind of uh, going to the end, I might say that we might suppose, and this is my the hypothesis, that the pressure imposed on Earth's atmosphere by the iron wind, as it uh, kind of uh, undergoes a discharge in the Earth's electric field, uh, leads to the formation of certain atmospheric structures, such as cyclones and anticyclones and Rossby waves and all kinds of other stuff. And the same process might be involved in the formation of features of a solar photosphere, namely granulation and sunspots. This is my A hypothesis. And this was the electric aspect of the story. Again, the magnetic one is at least partly covered in my previous talk. I was talking about how magnetic field might uh, increase this vorticity, how it might drive this rotation, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, there's still lots of questions with this. Uh, for example, uh, well, I've already outlined one of the possible connections to space weather, uh, namely the increase in galactic cosmic rays leading to weather anomalies. Uh, but uh, of course, also we have other pathways uh, in which solar wind, for example, might influence this whole system. For example, the magnetic field of the solar wind influences the ionospheric potential, so it changes the voltage difference between the ground and the ionosphere, which obviously would have an impact on something like this, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, then I had an idea that maybe we can look at total electron content maps. Uh, those are the maps of uh, electron content in the ionosphere and compare them to these structures. But so far, I haven't had any actual results and I'm actually, I don't think it's possible at least at the level of resolution that we have today with these maps. Okay, and uh, maybe there are some connections to long-term and large-scale structures, possibly uh, like um, long-term oscillations, maybe things like El Nino and so on and so forth and um, large-scale patterns of uh, atmospheric circulation could be, this is the, another thing to consider, 
in this context, especially with you know solar cycles and things like that. And uh, of course, one thing I have to note is uh, it's important to evaluate the level of importance of this process. So. Uh, it might be true, everything that I said, except that it doesn't do anything, you know? So, uh, <laughs> in the sense that all these structures might be created just from turbulence, just from regular thermodynamics, because we know that the uh, equations that describe air motion are nonlinear, they demonstrate chaotic behavior, and so on and so forth. So, it's important to um, evaluate the, actually how important is this exact process in the, uh, uh, the generation, uh, the production of these structures. But I feel that uh, there's more and more evidence that actually it is important. Uh, I cannot say definitely that it's the most important process, but it is what it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs>